Well, they've arrived, Hazel. So we're going to do the first part of chapter three. Fingers crossed. It's going to be all that Maya has imagined and is hoping for. <clears throat> Maya had been certain that the twins would be at the docks to meet them, but there was no sign of them or their parents. The passengers had all left the ship. Their luggage had gone through customs. The bustle of the quayside had died away and still no one had come to meet them. Do you think they've forgotten us? said Maya, trying to sound a little bit offhand. Suddenly she felt very forlorn and incredibly far away from anyone she knew. Don't be silly, snapped Miss Minton, but her nose looked even sharper than usual as she turned her head from side to side, searching the quayside. They had waited for an over an hour when a man in a crumpled cream suit and a Panama hat came up to them. I am Raphael Lima, the agent of Mr Carter, he said. He had a sad yellow face and a drooping moustache, and his hand, as he shook theirs, was moist and limp. Mr Carter has sent the boat for you. He could not come himself. They followed him and the porter to a floating dock on which were moored boats of every kind, dugout canoes, fleet sailing boats with names like Firefly and Swallow, and trim launches with gaily striped awnings and gleaming paint. But the Carter's boat, <coughs> excuse me, was painted a serious dark green, just like spinach. The awning was dark green too, and there was no name painted on the side, only the word Carter to show who owned it. As they came up to the boat, an Indian who had been perched on one of the bales of rubber waiting to be loaded got up and threw his cigarette away. This is Furo, the Carter's boatman. It is he who will take you there. And with another limp handshake, Lima was gone. Furo was not like the Indians they had passed, smiling and waving, <clears throat> not like the sailors on the boat with whom Maya had shared jokes. He showed them into the cabin and shrugged when they said they wanted to sit out on the deck. Then he started the engine, <clears throat> lit another cigarette and stared, unsmiling, out at the dark river. They travelled for an hour up the Negro, leaving all signs of the town behind them. Without realising it, Maya had edged closer to Miss Minton. It was oddly different, this stretch of the river, straight and silent, with no sandbanks or islands, and no animals to be seen. And the Indians working the rubber trees, who looked, looked up as the boat passed, then just turned away. Then Furo pointed to the right-hand bank, and they saw a low wooden house painted the same dark green as the boat, with a veranda running its length. And down on the jetty, waiting to greet them, were four people. A woman holding a parasol, a man in a sun hat, and two girls. The twins, cried Maya, her face alight. Oh, look, there they are. Her spirits rose with a bound. They were there and everything was going to be all right. Miss Minton gathered up their belongings. The boat came in quietly and without waiting for Furo to help her, Maya jumped out onto the jetty. Remembering her manners, she went first to Mrs Carter and curtsied. The twins' mother was plump with a heavily powdered face with a double chin and carefully waved hair. She looked like the sort of person who would smell of violets, violets or lavender, but to Maya's surprise, she smelled strongly of Lysol. It was a smell that Maya knew well because it was what the maids had used at school to disinfect the lavatories. I trust you had a good journey, she said, and looked taken aback when Maya said it had been lovely. Then she called, Clifford! And her husband, who had been giving orders about the boat, turned round to do his duty. Mr Carter was a thin, gloomy-looking man with gold-rimmed spectacles. He was wearing long khaki shorts and mosquito boots and did not seem very interested in the arrival either of Maya or her governess. Well, my tummy's going a bit now, Hazel. And now, as Miss Minton, in her turn, shook hands with the Carters, Maya was free to turn to the twins. 
she had imagined them well. They were fair, they were pretty, and they were dressed in white. They wore straw hats, each with a different coloured ribbon around the rim, one pink and one blue. And the sashes round their flanks dresses matched their hats. Their fair ringlets, a little limp in the heat, touched their collars. Their round cheeks were flushed. Their light blue eyes were framed by pale, almost colourless lashes. I'm Beatrice, said the one with the pink ribbon and the pink sash. She gave Maya her hand. Even so, short a distance from her house, she was wearing gloves. Maya turned from one to the other. Though they were so alike, down to the slight droop of their shoulders, she thought she would always be able to tell them apart. Beatrice was just a little plumper and taller. Her eyes had a little more colour. Her scanty ringlets had more body than Gwendolyn's. And she had a tiny mole on her neck. It was as though Beatrice was the mould from which Gwendolyn had been taken, and she guessed that Beatrice was the older, if only by a few minutes. But now Gwendolyn held out her hand. She had taken off her glove, and her hand stayed in Maya's a little longer than Beatrice's had done. Then they turned to follow their parents into the house. But Maya lingered for a moment, looking down at the palm of her outstretched hand. Then she shook her head, ashamed of her thoughts, and ran off after the others. An hour later, Maya and Miss Minton sat on upright chairs on the veranda, having afternoon tea with the family. The veranda was a narrow wooden structure which faced the river, but was completely sealed off from it by wire netting and glass. No breath of wind came from outside, no scent of things growing. Two flypapers hung down on either side on which dying insects buzzed frantically, trying to free their wings. On low tables were set bowls of methylated spirit in which a number of mosquitoes had drowned or were actually still drowning. Ooh, this isn't a pretty picture, is it? The wooden walls were painted the same dark clinical green as the house and the boat. It was like being in the corridor of a hospital Maya would not have been surprised to see people lying about on stretchers, waiting for operations. Mrs Carter sat at a wicker table pouring tea and adding powdered milk. There was a plate of small dry biscuits with little holes in them, but nothing else. We have them sent specially from England, said Mrs Carter, looking at the biscuits, and Maya could not help wondering why they had taken so much trouble. She had never tasted anything quite so dull. You will never find native food served at my table, Mrs Carter went on. There are people here who go to markets and buy the food the Indians eat, but I would never permit it. Nothing is clean. Everything is full of germs. She's a bit negative, isn't she? The word germs made her mouth pinch up into a disapproving O. Oh. Couldn't it be washed? asked Maya, remembering the lovely fruit and vegetables she had seen in the market. But Mrs Carter said washing just wasn't enough. We disinfect everything in any case, but it doesn't help. And if one is to survive out here, the jungle must be kept at bay at all times. The jungle certainly had been kept at bay. There were no plants on the windowsills, none of the lovely orchids and crimson flame flowers that had been on the balconies of the houses they had passed along the shore, and the garden was a square of raked gravel. In England, I always had cut flowers in the house, Mrs Carter went on. Lady Parsons used to say that no one could arrange roses better than me, didn't she, girls? The twins nodded in exactly the same way. Once down, once up. Yes, Mamma, they said. But not here. She sighed. Lady Parsons is a relation, she explained, a second cousin on my mother's side. Uh, do you have any pets? Maya shyly asked Gwendolyn, who was sitting next to her. There seemed to be no kittens, no dogs, no canaries singing in a cage anywhere in this dark house. In the corner, propped up against a chair, was a large flint gun full of fly spray. Gwendolyn turned to Beatrice. Maya had noticed already that it was usually Beatrice who 
who spoke first. Sorry, I've just had a little notification that is, there we go, it's not distracting me now. Um, it was usually Beatrice who spoke first. No, we certainly don't have any pets, she said. Pets bring in fleas and lice and jiggers, said Gwendolyn, smoothing down her spotless white dress. And horrible worms, said Beatrice. All right, girls, that will do, said Mrs Carter. A maid came to bring some more hot water. She had two gold teeth and the same sulky clothed look as Foro the boatman. And when Maya smiled at her, she did not smile back. Did you bring us any presents? Beatrice asked. And Maya said yes and asked if she could get them from her case. Oh, but those are made here. They're market things, said the girls when she came back. We want proper presents from England. Maya tried not to feel snubbed. Then she caught Miss Minton's eye and said, I wanted to bring some baby chicks. And the twins shuddered. Now, Miss Minton, if you will come with me, I will inform you of your duties, said Mrs Carter. Beatrice and Gwendolyn will show Maya where she is to sleep. The Carters had built their bungalow on land which had belonged to the Indians. The main rooms faced the river, the dining room with a large oak table and button back chairs, the drawing room furnished with overstuffed sofas, a marble clock and a large painting of Lady Parsons wearing a choker of pearls, and Mr Carter's study. All the windows were covered in layers of mosquito netting, and the shutters were kept partly closed, so that the rooms were not only hot, but dark. From the front of the house, two extensions ran backwards towards the forest. Maya's room was at the end of one of those, a small bare room with a narrow bed, a chest of drawers, a wooden table. There were no pictures, no flowers, and the smell of Lysol was overpowering. Mama made them scrub it out three times, said Beatrice. It used to be a storeroom. There was only one window, very high, but there were two doors, one which led out into the corridor and one which was bolted. Where does that door lead, Maya asked. Out to the compound where the servants live. You must keep it locked always. We never go out there. So how do you go outside? Maya asked. To the river, I mean, and the forest. The twins just looked at each other. Oh, going to leave it there, Hazel. Well, I don't know about you guys, but my tummy is sinking a little bit. It's not quite so far as Maya had been imagining. We can only hope that it will turn around, but I've got a feeling we're going to go on a slightly different journey before we get to something like that. Well, I am enjoying it though, I am. And like I say, I do think the descriptions are beautiful. So this will be Friday's recording, Hazel. I hope you've had a really good week in school. Um, have a lovely weekend and I will check back in with you on Monday. Okay, take care and bye for now. Bye. Bye.